the the high there. I might not meet the code. Yeah, was there. Cool. So, um, housekeeping. You have an assignment due this Friday. I will not be here this Thursday, Friday. I'm going to Melbourne. So, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm going to go and see the first child part one, part two, because I'm 50 next year. Not next year, next week. <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> so, back in close. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there's no workshop this week. It does mean I won't be around for when you hand in your assignment. I do apologise. I will be on email contact on the Thursday, but probably not the Friday. So if you really do need help on your assignment, please come earlier rather than later this week. Tomorrow will be the best day to come and see me. Okay? Um, I have written your exam. So that's all ready to go. That's now being checked. I will put up hopefully tonight last year's exam. Last year's exam wasn't written by me, it was written by Gary. But I think it's a good starting point to at least have an idea of the sort of questions to expect. The main difference between my exam and Gary's is first of all, mine won't inter cause actual internal hemorrhage. Well, I don't think it will. But the other thing is, I've definitely put more interpretation of output from code. So make sure that, obviously we've had a big focus on coding, so make sure you understand how to interpret output. The other thing is, I've also, I'm not going to ask you to code in a written exam, but I might give you code and expect you to understand what that code's doing and be able to discuss. So that'd be the main thing if you're wondering what the difference is. One, it should be hopefully nicer than Gary's, but, I can't guarantee that, but definitely implementation, interpretation of output from code, and being able to look at a piece of code understanding what it's doing, it's a good thing to focus on. We'll talk more about stuff as we get close to the time. So, last time we looked at sort of nonlinear effects and smoothing splines, cubic splines, natural splines, etc. So today we're going to look at three, well two methods that use that ideology. And then I'm going to introduce an extra thing called nonlinear regression, which is not really in the books, but it's one of these things, if you know about it, it becomes really, really useful if you ever do sort of apply statistics for chemists, biologists, people like that. So we're going to look at Mars, which is multivariate adaptive regression splines. So what they do is Mars builds models of this form. So you've got your coefficient, your CI, and you've got these basis functions. And the basis functions are of three sorts. You can have an intercept, you can have a hinge, what? <laughs> Some is that, is that, what? One, one of three forms. One of three <laughs> forms, though. <laughs> three forms? But also, <laughs> some of <laughs> each, each, each basis function. Yeah? Takes one of three forms. Oh, three forms, not three forms. Yeah, listeners come with your typing now. <laughs> yeah, that's just. And see, the problem is my spelling, when I check my spelling, well, by the way, it's a spelling package, you know, if you ever need to check your R mark down, it works really well. Yeah. But anyway, my spelling obviously said freezer are perfectly valid yeah, forms, it's just not one of the right ones. Also, you're summing from I to I. Oh, oh my God, I was writing this fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, other than the typos, we get a general idea. So, you've got these three forms. First, when you've got an intercept, you can have what we call a hinge function. So hinge functions are these two sorts. You can either have a max of zero and x minus a constant, where x is your predictor, or a max of zero, constant minus x. I'll show you what they look like in a second. Or you can do the product of two or more hinge functions. Okay. So here is my hinge function. So you've got two types, the positive and the negative. So there's the actual hinge function, but this is what it looks like. The whole idea is you have a value of zero, and then here's a cutoff point, and you have then a linear regression with a slope of one. Or the other alternative is it's got a slope protective one, and it gets down to your cutoff point, and then it becomes zero. And obviously they're called hinge functions because they're invented by Professor Hinge. But we'll keep that. People who listen to the recording. Toby said he'd be here today. I saw Toby today. He said he'll come. Obviously, something more important, like, I don't know, sparkly light. I know where you are, Tobin. <laughs> He's right there. there. Oh, <laughs> <my God. laughs> you can't.
can't do that. I can't dish you on the recording and say, where the fuck are you? And you just turn up and like, someone mentioned my name. I don't appear until I've mentioned. Ta-da! How long have you stood out there waiting? And he said, no, I'm missing the part of the lecture. I was listening to you. Listen to the recording. <laughs> so, how are you going to fit this? Well, you fit it in two phases. You have a forward pass and a backward pass. And the whole idea is the forward pass, we're just going to be, build a really overfitted model. Just going to add in all terms until we overfit it. And then once we've got that overfitted model, we're basically going to start removing terms, taking into account some sort of cross validation method. So, forward pass. You start with what they call the null model, which is just an intercept. And then what we do is we're going to add basis functions in. And when we add in hinges, we choose the pairs. So we choose the positive and negative pair for any hinge. So they're going to be the mirrors of one another, like we saw in that previous one. And you can basically, as you add in these new pairs, you can multiply them by any term already in the model. So the first time you're just going to have an intercept, so you just add in your pair of hinges. But over time, you can either add in just a new pair or you can actually get a product of pairs of hinges. And what we're going to do is as we compare it, we're going to look at all the existing terms we've got in there. We're going to explore over that space, over all the variable space, and all the cutoff value space. And out of all these possibilities, which is a big possibility, we choose the one that reduces the residual sum squares. I'm going to keep doing that until we don't get a decrease in the residual sum of squares. How they get the residual sum of squares is they just fit a linear regression. So you explore, you go, I could add these in, I can try all, remember each hinge function, even though symmetry is going to have a different cutoff point, and the cutoff point you choose of all the values of that predictor. You explore this huge space of just trying it each time, going, which is the best one, add it in, so you go to greedy algorithm, add them in, reducing the RSS. You keep going until any new term you add doesn't reduce the RSS enough. So you have a cutoff, you say. Once you get to the point you're not reducing it by more than one, or whatever you want, the default is, you stop at that point. So you've got this very overfitted model. And the other thing that people get confused is they think each predictor is just going to have one hinge. Predictors can have more than one hinge. So you can end up with like a load of sort of um, joined piecewise linear functions. Then we now remove the terms one by one based on a generalized cross validation. So they invented, the people who invented this method, I think called a generalized cross validation. So to give you an idea, it's, you've got your observation minus your fitting model, you add that up and take the average, but then you adjust by what they call the effective number of parameters which is your number of Mars terms, your K, plus this penalty term. When I checked the literature, they just said the penalty term is usually two or three. When I went to the paper to see why, they never really gave a justification of why the penalty term was two or three. It was just, obviously it worked for their case and everyone stuck with it. We have these, basically these effective number of parameters. But all you're doing is you're saying, if I remove this term, how does my generalized cross validation change? So can I get rid of it? So you've fitted this big, huge model, you've overfitted, and then you're now using cross-validation to basically throw terms out. So you get the smallest model that gives you good prediction, and that's it. That's called Mars. Now the problem with Mars is it was developed by a company that basically copyrights it. So you can use Mars. I, I forgot the company that actually made it, but you can actually buy a license to do it, and off you go. But no one does. Instead, we use Earth. It was called Earth because the original one was called Mars, and the guy who invented Earth thought Earth would be really good because you go from Mars to Earth. And then everyone went, what does he mean? So he invented a backronym. So here's the backronym. It's enhanced adaptive regression through hinges. There's a bet when he chose that name, he just sat there and he just had a moment of smugness, just went, my job here is done, yes. That's why I like the backronym. Backronym, you know backronym before? Oh, uh, backronym is where someone has thought that it was originally an acronym, so they've recreated the equivalent acronym when it even wasn't. After our score is one of the classic ones. 
So there's a library called Earth. So I'll refer to the Mars method, but the implementation is with the Earth package. And we're going to look at trees. And for trees, we have the girth, the height, and the volume. So you've probably seen this data set before. So here I'm going to look at volume, and I've regressed it on girth and height. And the idea is that you, know, you should be able to predict the height of the tree quite easily using advanced trigonometry. The girth is quite easy to do with a simple tape. And then once you've got that, you can work out the volume of your tree. So when you're not cutting it over, well, obviously feeling really bad because you destroyed the tree, you can now make it into wood chips and know how many wood chips you've got. So you can see that there seems to be a positive relationship. The one with the girth seems to be reasonably linear, while the one with the height seems to have a bit of heteroskelasticity. So here's how you fit it. It's very similar to before. You've got earth, volume, tilde, and everything else. Data equals trees. And then summary. And here you can see my equation. So if I want to calculate the volume, my intercept is 29 minus 3.4 times. You would do 14 minus girth, and you would take the max between that and zero. And it just spits it out like that. You can see the termination condition was where the um, the residual squared was changed by less than 0.001 of five terms. You can also do interaction. So in that one, it just considered up to linear terms. You can actually go up and say, no, I'll have degree equals two. So now you can see that I've got a girth times a p max. So you now have got interactions between the terms as well. Um, what I've done here is there's a built-in plot function that shows you the hinge. It doesn't show them very well, but here you've got girth, and you notice it looks quite good. It goes quite linearly, and then there's a kink, and it goes steeper with the fitting. That looks quite good, but the height looks a little bit, to use a statistical term, a little bit shit. Because it seems to be missing, but remember, this hinge is not just about the relationship between volume and height. It's the relationship between volume and height taking into account girth. So sometimes you'll find that that relationship isn't as nice as you expect. Here it is in two dimensions. You can see that you've got these, um, generally with the girth, you can see you've got that increasing. You've got a bit of a kink in the middle when it comes to height. Um, the best use I've seen of Mars so far is Mel has been using it to look at in forensics. They have a load of basically bone tissue and they've got this, and they want to use the bone tissue to predict the age of infants in forensics. So using this, if you think about it, it works really nicely because you have growth rates. You know, you, your limbs grow really quickly, and then you sort of have adolescence, and then you settle out to adulthood. So hinge functions and bars works really well on that. If you want to know more about that, go talk to Mel. It's interesting stuff. You can actually do prediction, but you have to, at this point, we haven't had any variance term. Notice I didn't write plus epsilon, and epsilon is normal. So if you want to do prediction, you have to give it some sort of variance model. It doesn't automatically do it. It's actually a, a non-parametric methodology. So here, you, if you repeat it, if I want prediction, you repeat it, but notice you have to now, they're going to do some variation methods, so I can do a linear modeling. And LM. There's various options. As soon as you do that, you need to let it know how many folds you're going to do in your cross validation, how many cross validations to get its prediction bounds. But now, if I do my plot my trees and put it in, it will show the points, but it will actually give me prediction intervals as well. But you do have to think very carefully, and I haven't gone into detail because there's lots and lots of different variance models, and you just choose one that is most appropriate for your data. So GAMS, so that's the first use of sort of non-linear, in this case they were just piecewise linear hinges. Now we're gonna to go to GAMS, or Generalized Additive Models. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let ourselves, so at the moment we just individually took a predictor, and we said perhaps we could have some sort of non-linear model, some spline to show the relationship. GAMS is just now gonna take lots of these and take a linear combination of them. So you think about it, you can extend your linear models 
So now we allow nonlinear functions for each of the variables while maintaining additivity. So you take each predictor, you have a nonlinear function, and you're going to add together linear combinations of these to get your predictor. So it's very similar to what we did before when we had our spline, but there we had a single predictor. Now we're going to have multiple predictors. So the general form is going to be yi equals b to 0 plus b1 f1 xi1. So you see this f1 is some sort of nice smooth function. So it could be a cubic spline, it could be a smoothing spline, it could be a lowest. And I'm going to take a linear combination of that. And notice that at the moment we're treating each predictor separately. So you go to the first predictor and go and have some sort of linear model as I have smoothing spline of that, plus a linear combination of a smoothing, smoothing spline, etc. Plus some standard noise structure. I'll let you decide on your own little noise structure. So, as an example, we'll go back to the wage data. So, here's our wage data, just to remind you. And we're going to look at a very simple model. Now, you don't need to use GAN. You could just do a linear model. All I've done here, for example, is um, my NS, my natural spline, my cubic spline. Or, in this case, I've done degrees of freedom 4 and 5. So I've just taken that and I've automatically put in, in this case, my cubic splines for year and age. I've added some education and I'm going to regress wage on that just in a linear model. Okay? But GAMS will actually do a lot of this automatically. So here, I can actually go, well, all I want is a smoothing spline plus a smoothing spline plus education. I'll spend four degrees of freedom on year, five degrees of freedom on age, and I'll just do a GAM. So it will go and choose your smoothing spline. It's got the degrees of freedom. But you've got some laxity there. It can move stuff around and try and work out how to fit it. And the question is, how do you actually fit this? It uses quite a nice little technique. Now, here's the results. So you can see here, you've got your smooth spline of year four on year. So you can see the actual relationship, the smoothing spline is done. So it's done, um, it's got a bit of a king there, which surprised me for the smoothing spline. That's all right. So there's your relationship when you look at year. There's your much smoother one when you're looking at age. And we've seen, we've seen age lots of times before. We saw that nice or smooth one when we were looking at things like lowest and smoothing spline. And remember there was no, it was just straight education. There was no smoothing equivalent. And you're not gonna have that really in something that's a categorical variable. So here's education. For all those that are now getting more education, you're glad to see that the, the bars are a little bit higher over to the right where you're heading towards. So how does it actually do it? Well, the smoothing spine version is fitted using back fitting. So what you do is you keep going back. So you really want to sort of say, like the smoothing spine on its own, if you can fit, you want to say, let's choose the best smoothing spline within this multiple predictor model. So how are we gonna sort of like, sort of take into account what the other ones are doing to find the best smoothing? So it's not just say, what's the best smoothing spline for wage on age? What's the best smoothing spline of wage on age, given the smoothing splines of the other predictors? So it does a thing called backfitting. So it's going to repeatedly update the fit for each predictor while holding the other predictors fixed. So you fit the other ones and then you update that one and get the best coefficients and then you go back and you update it. And then do this with a partial residual. So let's assume that F1 and F2 are known. Then what I can do if I want to now come and fit my X3 is I work out the residual by taking my observed value, take off the other fitted values fit my model for that by doing a basically a nonlinear regression of x3. So you fit your f3 by using your residuals as opposed to your observed values. So you've gone and taken your observed, you said take off this predictor, now fit my model, and then you can take off the other one. So you're basically regressing by taking away all the other predictors except for this one. Now fit the best version of that and just iterate between the predictors again and again until you get no improvement. So, pros. 
it can fit nonlinear functions to each x, j automatically. It's really nice. All you really do is you assign how many degrees of freedom, and it goes away in the zip. Very accurate predictions. Additive nature means you can still look at the effect of x, l, and y, given the extra fit. So you can still see that relationship, as we saw when we looked at age and GA before. You can actually see that relationship. And to summarize, the smoothness is just basically summarized by degrees of freedom. And you can allocate, you might say, well, I'm happy to have more degrees of freedom for age than year. We need to change the model, see how it does. Again, how do you know which degrees of freedom to do? Explore the space. Write itself a map function, multiple ones, use AIC, BIC, cross validation, any means of fine. Russ? The problem with this will be that you, if you have correlations between your x's, you will lose part of that as you fit through. And so you won't. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely right. You say in the poem means you can't allocate for interaction terms. There may be some sort of collinearity between the non-smooth function. As yet, GAMs do not take that into account. I haven't had a chance to look at the literature to see if someone's incorporated, but yeah, really good point. So good a point I made a slide for you. Yeah, slide, yeah. And if you have in front of me, which I didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's a beautiful, the standard form does not have interactions as yet. Yeah. So you don't have that extra. I don't know why they, I suppose because you're trying to regress, it's really hard to now do that back fitting where you want to take two things at the same time. You have to take that interaction first, but then you yeah. do something the other one. Um, how did you do it? Um, so um, S for smooth is fine. There's also a nice built-in function LO for lowest, where you can give your span. So here I've done a smooth spline on year of four. By age, I've decided to do a lowest with a span of 0.7 plus education. It sort of just puts everything together in one big model and off you go. So here's our year relationship. Here's our age, our education. But as I said, and Ross nicely pointed out, it doesn't do interactions because of the nature of the way it does the back fitting. It has to keep everything else fixed. So you can't take into account that interaction term. So I'm going to add this extra. This isn't actually in the James textbook, but this is a technique that's really useful. And it, when, it, when you need it, it's great. You may never use it, but I've used it with Charles Pierce. I also used it with a couple of... Um, biostatisticians. So at the moment, we let the data describe the model. But that's not always the case. What happens when someone comes up with a model and says, well, actually, I know the relationship should be this. So chemistry, biology, physics, they'll often go and say, here is the model that I want. I just need to estimate the parameters within my model. OK? So let's uh, motivate with an example. So we've got some data called the L minor. So this was a type of um, fungus, and it's the update of this fungus of nitrogen, depending on the concentration. So they took this fungus, they put it into nitrogen concentrations, and they looked at the rate it absorbed the nitrogen into the cells. So this is the observations. Not a lot of data, but you can see as the concentration increases, we see the rate of absorption goes up, but then it seems to level out. To be honest, I would just get rid of this point, ignore it, and just fit a straight line. But the biologists don't want this to be much nicer. It's an outlier, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, right? I just save you time. We can all go home now. <laughs> Instead, Michaelis and Menton came up with a model. Oh, well done then. It was such a hard model, they had to work together. So there's the model. So it's the relationship between uptake rate and concentration that you see in a lot of chemical reactions, which has two parameters. It has a Vm, which is your carrying capacity type part, and your K, which is the rate of increase. So let's say I wanted to fit this model. So I've got my observations. I've got the X. Now I want to actually get my Vm and my K. Now, one of the things you do in first year, we would have told you to go and basically try and linearize, linear, linear, make it linear. So you might try taking logs and things like that, and that often works in a lot of nice cases. But sometimes you just want, the models might get complicated within biochemistry or biology, etc. 
So what I'm going to do is we're going to assume this. We're going to assume that my y's is I've got my relationship that explains the expected value, the mean, plus some noise. Nice thing about this is you are assuming that you can just add the noise to that model. Remember, if you start taking logs, etc., you're not going to get the same noise term as if you just add your noise. You're going to end up with more collective noise or something like that. So how do we do it? It's really nice. There's a function called NLS, which does it automatically. It's built into R. And what you do with this is you feed NLS, first of all you give your equation. So in this case I've got rate is my VM times comp over K plus comp. Now at the moment obviously R has no idea what are parameters, no idea what is going to be your data. So you basically you don't know what data is and you go star equals and you tell it the parameter, you give it starting points. So how you choose your starting points? Well one, you can sometimes linearize the model, look at it, get estimates of that. You can actually look at a grid of values in starting points. There is actually built into NLS what they call an automatic starter type thing, which will explore the space and try and choose a starter. I'm just assuming they've got some nice starting points, and it uses numerical. It's basically going to try and look at minimizing the residual sum of squares between our two models. And here we are. It's now just everything that we wanted to do. It gives us estimates of parameters, it gives us standard errors of our parameters. You can also, if you really wanted to, get confidence intervals. Confident. For those who don't know, confident is a standard method built into R that for most models will return the confidence intervals of your parameters. For everyone who's been doing them by hand up until this point, I do apologise. We don't tell you to honest, so you don't do it automatically. It's best if you go through the pain that we went through. So here's your nice 95% um, confidence intervals for those parameter values. So it's really good. You can take your data and they can give you a model and you can fit it in, no problem. And there's the fitted values. She's not too bad. Still like analyzer. Yeah, I think we'd best get rid of it, but again, biologists, bless them. What about group data? So now we're going to look at pure mycin. Pure mycin is antibiotic. And now we're using actually the same equation. We're going to use it for the rate of an enzymic reaction given our concentration. So we've got concentration rate, but we take, took some cells and we treated them with the antibiotic pure mycin, and the rest were left untreated. The question is, how is this enzyme affected by the antibiotic pure mycin? So here's my observations. I've got more outliers to get rid of this time. It's going to be a little bit more difficult explaining it to them. Bastards when they've got some real data this time. Especially when they have a little data, you can layers are so easy just to go, let's get rid of that point. But now factors have gone and got all that data that makes it look like it might be an actual beautiful curve. So you can see again, concentration increases, the rate increases and then settles down. But the level it settles down, that seems to depend on whether it's been treated with the antibiotic or not treated. So in this case, we find the antibiotic increases the action of this enzyme, increases the rate. So what I'd really like is some model like this that says, well, with state, I want a K for each state, which is treated or not treated, and maybe a VM for each state, treated or not treated. So it'd be really nice if I could actually get that sorted somehow. And you might wonder why I've used square brackets rather than some sort of subscript, because it matches ideally exactly how the model works. It's really nice. First time I discovered this, I'm like, it's just brilliant. I was doing all these indicator functions. But NLS has a notation that says, I've got an extra column in my data called state, in this case. And what I want is VM can have a value for each possible state. The same with my k for each possible state. Now obviously what I need to do now is I have two states, so I'm going to have to give it two starting values for k and two starting values for vm. I just chose the point one and two and just broke the same. I just said go and sort it out. And here's my data. 
The problem is, if you think about your p-values with this model, they're testing whether k1 or k2 is equal to zero, or v1, m, or v, m2 are equal to zero. What I really wanted to ask the question of, well, do I need two values of k, do I need two values of vm? Perhaps I could get rid of one of them. So, the easiest way I found of doing this when I was playing around with it, is I fitted lots of model. I've already fitted the model where you have altogether four parameters. One for e, k for each state, a vm for each state. So the first model, fit two there, I have one single value of vm, but two possible values of k. Number three, I have two possible values for vm and one value for k. And finally, I, well, I think of as my normal model, I have one value for vm and one value for k. So now, altogether, I've got four models. One that has complete freedom, two Ks, two VMs. One that says, I'll lock down VM, two possible values of K. One, I'll lock down K, two possible values of VM. Or one where I say, no, just one value of VM, K, all of them. And then I'm just going to compare them with just an over. So the first one I do is I compare my full model with model four. So it shows you the models. I'm comparing the one where I have two values of VM and two values of K with the one where I just have one of each. You can see my p-value is small, so I'm saying, is there a significant difference between these two models? The null says, no, there's no difference. The alternative says, yes, they're different. My p-value is really small, so there is a difference between these two models. So remember, our general approach is going to the smallest model possible unless it makes a big difference. So this makes a big difference. So I can't just have a single value of VM and K. But maybe I could get away with a single value of VM or K separately. So this is the one where I now say, I've got my full model, and now look at one value of VM and two values of K. Now you've got a significant p-value. So I'm sort of going, can I get away with just one value of VM? No. So I'm just comparing them two. The poor p-value being so small says a significant difference. So by losing that information in the VM, going from two VMs to one VM, I've made a significant difference to my model, so I shouldn't do it. Now I go and say, well, what about if I just had one value of k? Now I have a p-value of 0.2. So I'm saying, I've got these two models, I've compared them, they're not significantly different. So in other words, when I go from two values of k to one value of k, it doesn't affect my model. So that should be fine. So I need two values of vm, one value of k. So that's the model of fit. And there they are. Could you have done uh, all, all that in one and over command, just given all four models, or did you want to specify the order? Um, I was worried about how I was going to do the comparisons. I wasn't sure. I didn't know whether it was going to do sequential and over, or to compare them to one. So I'd rather break it down. Because remember, there's an over and an over. The standard and over with the lowercase a does sequential, but the one you actually want is the one where you're comparing everything to the null, which is only built into the car. Again, I wasn't sure how it was doing it, so I thought it was better to, to be careful. Does everyone understand what that means with the sequential and over? And the, the fact is that with sequential, you're comparing each model to just the one above, you're not comparing them to the null. So you just have to be careful with the comparisons if you use the over command. So that is, we took Mars, which is loads of hinge functions. We took GAMS, which is putting together all the smooth functions in general predictive models. And now we've got, and as I said, this was just an extra, it's just, I've used it a couple of times. We used it with Charles Peirce to show when Maoris arrived in New Zealand by looking at partition scars. I mean, who doesn't? But I've also did a paper with Josh Ross's brother-in-law on biostatistics. But sorry, biochemistry using this. So it's a really, really useful technique. There's a really nice book on this by Springer, which goes through the NLS. But it's one of these things that no one ever told me, and when I discovered it, I'm like, why did you never tell me that? Because that is so useful when you're actually given a model. Cool. That's it. On Wednesday, we will start on classification trees. If anyone needs help for the assignment for this week, remember, I'm not here Thursday, Friday, 
Tuesday, Wednesdays, the better days to catch me. Thank you very much. See you all on Wednesday.